Good morning, everybody. So, kind of a fun uh, study we have today, and a little different than the norm. Yesterday, we read from verse 25 all the way down to verse 31 of John 14. Today, I want to go back and just look at verse 29. I mentioned that we kind of moved quickly through it all, and I I kind of felt like I was going to come back and take a look at it. And I wasn't sure what we'd come back and take a look at. And then verse 29 just popped out at me. So give this a share. Let people know because this is cool stuff. You see, verse 29 is where Jesus says, And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I don't know if you've been asked before, but there's that common question, why Christianity? Why Jesus? I mean, there's all these religions in the world. Why the Bible? Why should you believe it above them? What makes Christianity any different from Islam or from Buddhism or from other religions? And there are a lot of ways you can answer that question. And I think depending on who you are talking to and who you are and what you are most comfortable talking about, you might answer that question in different ways. Why Christianity? One of my favorite answers and probably always my first go-to answer is prophecy. You see, no other religion has told the future like the Bible. No other religion has that to offer. In fact, most other religions have made prophecies and they have failed to come true. This is true with the Mormon religion. This is true with the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is true with many religions where they make claims similar to the Bible, except for their claims have ended up not happening. So, now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe Most unbelievers probably won't sit with you long enough for you to answer all these things, but if they were really open-minded to hear what the Bible has to say, you could show them quite a few places where the Bible told the future and it came to pass just as the Bible said. Let's go take a look. First, Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, 21 to 29. You see, this is an area where basically it just puts into practice what we're talking about. Maybe I'll just go up and read 21 to 24. So Isaiah 41 says, Present your case, says Yahweh, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. So he's willing to now do a showdown. He says, okay, Let's, let's throw down. Let's see what you're made of. Verse 22, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Show us things thereafter that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or evil that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. And so what he's trying... I got hit a button wrong. Sorry, someone was calling. What he's saying is that you need to tell the future. He goes, yeah, tell me the future and then we'll see that you're really God. And that's what God says. So this is God's own challenge to false religions. It's not our answer, it's his answer. Why pick him? Well, God says, because I tell the future and they don't. This is chapter 41. If I back up just a little bit to the beginning of the chapter, in verse two it says, who raised up one from the east? See, there's this prophecy we see in Isaiah in a few places where God is gonna raise up a leader. If you jump forward to chapter 44, at the end of chapter 44, going into chapter 45 of Isaiah, it says in verse 28, so maybe it belonged in the beginning of 45, it says, 
Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasures, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. So, he goes on ahead and tells this story. Now, Isaiah wrote this long before uh, Jerusalem fell and Babylon came in. So, Isaiah is written between like 680 and 700 B.C., it's not for hundreds of years to pass, or a couple hundred years at least, that Babylon takes them captive, and the Jews go off to Babylon. And while they're in Babylon, the Assyrians take over the Babylonians. And the Assyrians were led by a guy named Cyrus. Cyrus goes there, and he ends up attacking Babylon by night. We're familiar with the story in the book of Daniel. Belteshazzar has this big party. He brings out all of the riches from the temple and is using them for his party favors. And then a hand appears and starts writing on the wall. Many, many tickle, sorry, yeah. Anyway, he's writing on the wall and it tells him that he's been found wanting. He was weighed and he's found wanting. He lacks and he's freaking out, and Daniel translates it. And that night, the gates were left unlocked. And the Medo-Persian Empire, not the Assyrians, I said Assyrian, didn't I? Medo-Persian Empire was able to sneak in through the gates. The gates were left open, as was mentioned here in Isaiah 45, 1. Isaiah names this guy by name. And it says down in verse 4, I have named you though you have not known me. Isaiah wasn't a Christian. I, or sorry, Isaiah wasn't a Christian. Mean, it's been a rough night. Cyrus was not a believer, yet God called him to do this work. Josephus writes in Antiquities that when Cyrus sneaks in through the open gates, that he takes over the city and Daniel is presented to him. And Daniel shows up with the book of Isaiah and shows him, here's your name. And here's where it says the gates are going to be left unlocked. And here's it says, although you didn't know me, the God of Israel, I'll call you by name. And it blew his mind. You see, no other religion has this kind of stuff to offer. If Isaiah is not enough, we could flip over to Ezekiel. And when you get over to Ezekiel, chapter 20, do, 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 do. is it 27? 26. You see this proclamation against Tyre in Ezekiel 26. It talks about the many nations that would come up against Tyre, but they'd not be successful. It mentions how Nebuchadnezzar is going to come up against Tyre, and he's going to destroy the main city, but he wouldn't be able to destroy the rest of it. It says that they wouldn't get any plunder. And that's what happens is Bab they evacuate the city of Tyre and they move out to an island. So he was able to sack the city, but he wasn't able to get any of the riches because they took the riches with them as they moved out to the island. But then it says in verse 12, they will plunder your riches and pillage your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. They will lay your stones, your timber, and your soil in the midst of the water. Now what's interesting in verse 12 is it begins with the pronoun they. Verses back in verse 8 and elsewhere, it has the pronoun he. You see, he, Nebuchadnezzar, would attack and destroy the mainland city. But they, a different group, would come in and tear down the stuff and throw everything into the water. And what we find today, if you see where Tyre is on a map, it's on this little peninsula. And what it was, was when Alexander the Great came to conquer the city of Tyre, it was on an island. And he tried hiring Phoenician ships, but he wasn't able to conquer them by sea because the, 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 
tired, just their navy was too strong. And so he took all the remains of the first city and he piles them out into the water, making a causeway so he could attack it by foot. But again, we see it laid out with descriptions of how the battle would take place before it ever happened. There was Isaiah. There was Ezekiel. Let's flip over to Daniel, another biblical book of prophecy. And Daniel's full of great prophecies. But one of my favorite is in Daniel chapter 11. Speaking of Alexander the Great. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall have great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. Now, to start, remember back in Isaiah 45, or 44 even, how Cyrus would come in and talk about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Well, Cyrus was the great general leader of the armies that made way for Darius. And it was him who gave the command to rebuild Jerusalem. When they first were allowed to go back and start the building process, the command to build the walls didn't come until later. And you'll read about that in Daniel chapter 9. But here it talks about how there would be three kings after Darius the Mede. And this next one would be the richest of them all. And that was the peak of the Medo-Persian Empire. This king was known as Anaxerxes, or Xerxes, or Ahasuerus. There's other names for him. He was the king from the book of Esther. He's also the king from the famous story and famous modern movie of 300, the 300 Spartans. You see, Xerxes would rise up against Greece, which is funny because at the time this was written, Greece was a bunch of city-states. They were a bunch of nobodies. Small, little, tiny kingdoms, with each with its own king. It was not a united empire of Greece. It was not one big Grecian empire. So the idea that the Persians would fight the Greeks was kind of silly because the Greeks were nobodies. There were so many Persians, there were not that many Greeks because they were all divided. But what happened was when Xerxes attacked and the Spartans and Sparta fought back, it allowed the Greeks to unite into one large empire. Greece, Macedonia, they became this huge Greek empire. And Philip's son, Alexander, took that empire and he conquered more of the known world than anyone ever had. And so it talks about how Persia would rise against Greece, but then a mighty king would arise out of Greece. And he should rule with great dominion, do according to his will. But then when he had arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided to the four wings, but not among his posterity. You see, Alexander didn't have an heir, a legitimate heir. He had some kids. Um, some were killed and one wasn't really fit to lead. But so there wasn't a fit heir, and Alexander died very young. He died in his early 30s. And so when Alexander the Great died, what happened? Well, his kingdom gets divided, and it was divided to his four generals. So when it says four winds here, that's referring to those four generals, not to his own family, but uprooted and spread out amongst these guys. Two of those guys are Ptolemy the first and Seleucus. And as you kept, if you keep reading through Daniel 11, you get the north and the south, the warring kings of the north and the south, starting in verse 5. That's the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire. So you have all these stories throughout the whole Bible. And you'll notice that I didn't focus today on messianic stories, the prophecies of Jesus, all these other prophecies, the prophecies about the Jews being scattered. I just focused on secular history. 
It's full of this stuff. And so you have to understand that no other religion has this to offer. And so when Jesus, back in John chapter 14, verse 29, I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. He was talking about his resurrection and his death. But we can see the whole Bible is full of things being told before they come that people may believe. Some of those prophecies are worth learning about so you can share them with other people and make the point. No other religion tells the future like the Bible does. God bless you guys, and I will see you tomorrow.